Uh, okay, perfect. Hi, I'm Bethany Goldblum. I'm the scientific director of the NSSC. Welcome to our webinar. It is a great pleasure to host Stefan Friedrich today from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Wait, that's not what I want. Is that good? Yeah. Um, Stefan is the point of contact for the Nuclear Science and Security Consortium at Livermore. And he's also a scientist there in the cryogenic detectors group. Looking for interested graduate students um, to work on this topic. So it's a pleasure to welcome Stefan here today. Thank you very much, Bethany. Appreciate the introduction. So uh, I'll be talking today about a certain type of gamma ray detectors that have incredibly low, high energy resolution. And the way you do this is you go to extremely low temperatures. And um, this is work that is done by myself and a postdoc on Bo Kim at Lawrence Livermore. And we work a lot with various universities uh, because it's a new field where a lot of fundamental science still needs to be done. And that's the kind of stuff that is typically much better done with university collaborations than at the uh, national labs. There was a grad student from Berkeley on this project, Cameron Bates. He is now a graduate and works at Los Alamos. He just told me that he has been turned into a staff scientist there and bought a house. So he's now actually a real scientist. <laughs> We're also working with a university in Germany um, that has pioneered this kind of technology, University of New Mexico, where we get our current uh, detectors from, and a company called Star Cryoelectronics to commercialize these detectors because um, ultimately we don't want to be the ones who just use these detectors. In our lab, we want to make sure that these detectors are used widely uh, throughout the world. So why would anyone build gamma ray detectors that you have to cool to temperatures close to absolute zero before you can operate them? And um, there's one primary resolution uh, reason for that, and that is energy resolution. So the basic rule is the lower the operating temperature of your detector, the higher the energy resolution. Most of you who have uh, worked with germanium detectors know that you need to cool germanium detectors if you want to exploit the properties of germanium to get higher energy resolution than what you can get with scintillators or with gas. Um, if you want to push this to the extreme, you need to go to even lower temperature, and that's what we're doing today. And one of the examples uh, that I want to show you just as a motivation is the first picture, the first spectrum here. It's a mixed isotope uranium sample. It is from Savannah River. Uh, it was from some uranium casting process. They cast uranium metal into various shapes. And uh, then there is a leftover uranium in the uh, casting iron. And that contains all kinds of uh, different isotopes. And you want to do an analysis on this to understand you know, uh, what is in your uranium sample. And so you can see this is a spectrum, a spectrum of the same sample taken with three different detectors. Uh, in blue, the coaxial germanium detector. Uh, in uh, light green, the uh, LEPS germanium detector, the low energy germanium detector. And in red, the cryogenic detectors that's operated at about 100 millikelvin. And you can see. Um, the germanium detector is very nice, can see all kinds of different lines, but when you have a cryogenic detector, your background is reduced and your lines become much sharper, and so all kinds of little peaks show up above the background that give you uh, much more information than you could ever get with conventional detectors. So these are the kind of, sim uh, these are the kind of motivations why we're all interested in uh, developing detectors with these really low uh, operating temperatures. So I assume that most of the people in the audience have uh, taken some course of uh, nuclear uh, engineering, uh, probably even a, a course on detector technology. I assume you're familiar that you know in the early days in the 1930s, people started to build gas detectors, Geiger Miller counter, proportional counters. They were large. They were operated at room temperature, uh, and they were wonderful. Uh, but then in the 1950s, uh, people discovered sodium iodide and suddenly you realize, oh my God, we can actually do, do spectroscopy on nuclear materials and we can see different lines. 
And that was a huge deal because for the first time you can actually see the energy of nuclear transitions from the um, uh, from the uh, from the energies of the gamma rays. Energy resolution improved a lot over gas detectors, and you were still operating at 300 Kelvin. And then 20 years later, in the 70s, people discovered that germanium would actually work as a detector material. Again, this was a huge step forward because suddenly you could improve your energy resolution by a factor of 10 over what scintillators had been able to do. The price that you had to pay was you had to cool things down to liquid nitrogen temperatures. And I remember when I was a grad student, um, there was an old professor who told me from the 60s that in the 60s there were these new technologies coming along called germanium and people were telling me that is all nonsense. No one will ever want to use a detector that you need to cool to 77 Kelvin before you can use it. And uh, well, then they saw the spectra and they said, wow, where can I get one? And we are pushing exactly the same approach further. Now that 20 years after the germanium detectors, there's this whole class of cryogenic detectors that came along. They're operating at uh, much lower temperatures, you know, not around 100 Kelvin, but around 100 millikelvin. And you can get even a factor 10 uh, to 100 higher resolution than what you can get with germanium. And that is the driving force. The cost that you pay, the price that you pay is, well, it is simply not that simple to cool things down to 100 millikelvin. Although even that is getting much simpler, as I will show you later. But the general rule is lower temperature energy, uh, operation gives you higher energy resolution and that allows higher precision nuclear analysis. And that's the game that we're in. So how do these low temperature calorimeters work? Most fundamentally, these detectors are really small, really sensitive thermometers. So what they do, they, I'm not, can, people can't see this, right? They uh, can actually, see, yeah. So what these detectors consist of, they consist of an absorber for the, energy, for the radiation that you care about, and a really small thermometer, and then a weak thermal link of your thermometer to your, uh, to your cryostat. You keep this cryostat at a super low temperature, and when a gamma ray comes in, it's absorbed here in your absorber that heats it up. You can measure the increase in temperature with your sensitive thermometer, and then both the absorber and the thermometer cool back down to the base temperature of your cryostat for your weak link. And when you look at the signal from such a thermometer, uh, you can see that you, know, you have your star at some base temperature, around 100 millikelvin, then a gamma ray comes in, the temperature increases. Um, you measure the temperature increase, and the temperature increases proportional to the energy of the gamma ray, and inverse proportional to the heat capacity. And then as the absorber and the thermometer cool back down, you have a thermal decay constant that is given by the heat capacity divided by the thermal conductance between the absorber and your cryostat. So, when you go through the numbers, one of the things you can see uh, is that uh, the energy resolution of such a detector, which is basically set by the noise uh, in, your, um, in your baseline, is determined by the absolute temperature T and the heat capacity C. So if you want the energy resolution to be small, you need to keep the temperature low and the heat capacity small. And that basically forces you to do two things. You need to go to the temperatures as low as you can, reasonably achieve, and 100 millikelvin is sort of a good compromise between what is easy to do and what gives you the right energy resolution. And then you can't make the detector too big because the bigger the detector gets, the bigger the heat capacity, and then you lose energy resolution. So there's always some trade-off between efficiency and, um, and energy resolution. So that's why these detectors are typically called microcalorimeters. They're called calorimeters because they are literally measure heat. And they're microcalorimeters because each pixel has to be made small. Now, if you want to make bigger uh, detectors, you can't have one large detector. What you have, you need to make different uh, pixelated detectors like you do in a CCD camera or in other devices. And that's one of the things you can overcome this problem that each pixel needs to be very small. So if you take nothing away from this talk today, two things to keep in mind. 
The microcalorimeters have really, really high resolution and they're super small, super sensitive, super cold thermometers. And there is a trade-off between low temperature and efficiency. So the kind of microcalorimeters that we're building are actually magnetic microcalorimeters. What they really do, they are, they change the magnetic properties when a gamma ray is absorbed. So look at your detector here. Your detector basically consists of a uh, gold erbium material. Let's see, let's see where we are. This is your detector. It mostly consists of gold, and there's a little bit of doping it with a little bit of erbium. And erbium is magnetic. And what you can do if you apply a magnetic field, then you split the energy levels um, of your um, uh, of your magnetic ions. And if your temperature is low enough, the low energy levels are occupied and the higher energy levels are unoccupied. It's just the Zeeman effect. I mean, you probably know that when you have when you have zero magnetic field, a spin up and spin down state have the same energy. If you apply a magnetic uh, field, uh, you, you split the energy levels. One gets a little bit lower energy, one gets a little bit higher energy. And if your temperature is low enough, only the low energy state is occupied, the high energy state is unoccupied. And when a gamma ray comes in, it heats up your gold, that promotes your uh, spins from the low energy state into the higher energy state with the opposite spin direction. That changes the magnetic properties. And you can read that change in magnetization out with a, a specialized squid preamplifier. So literally what we're doing, we're absorbing the gamma ray, increases the temperature, that changes the magnetic properties of your detector, and that changes the current into the squid, and then you measure the output of the squid preamplifier. So we're literally measuring the magnetization upon absorption of a single gamma ray photon. And because you are at such a low temperature, you can get very high energy resolution. Just for those who have taken detector courses, you will know that the energy resolution is fundamentally determined by the statistics of your signal generator. So when you generate, make have a germanium detector, you create a certain number of electron hole pairs when you absorb a, a gamma ray. And the energy resolution is fundamentally limited by the fluctuations in the number of electron hole pairs that you generate. So your signal scales like uh, the, uh, well, your signal scales with the energy of your detector and the noise scales with the square root of the energy of the detector uh, of the gamma ray because um, the fluctuation scale with the square root of the number of electron hole pairs. So if you want higher energy resolution, what you have to do, you have to find materials that have a smaller energy gap so that you can get more signal carriers and get a higher energy resolution. That's exactly what we do in this particular case. So in, there are actually several technologies that people are developing for cryogenic detector operation. The uh, magnetic calorimeters are, have an advantage that they have very low electronic noise. And the reason for that is there is no bias current and no resistive elements in, uh, in a magnetic detector. So you may remember for your germanium detector, uh, there's always a certain leakage current, and that leakage current actually determines what the energy resolution is what you get, because that sets the electronic noise. In a magnetic detector, you don't have any current. You just apply a magnetic field. You have the Zeeman splitting. No current flows in the quiescent state. So that gets rid of that, gets rid of that uh, source of noise. And also in a, a germanium detector, you have resistive elements, like typically your uh, feedback circuit has some resistor in it, and that produces uh, some Johnson noise. Um, and so that also contributes to the electronic noise. Again, a gamma rated a magnetic detector has no resistor in it, means no noise, and that gives you the advantage of producing a very high energy resolution compared to other detectors. And the reason why we use uh, gold erbium is, well, because it basically has the right properties that we want. It has a good spin half system at low temperatures, and it can produce, a, has a very high you know, sensitivity at these low energies. For those of you who remember their physics courses, um, they rem probably remember that uh, the susceptibility of a spin system changes like uh, with one over T at low temperatures. That's the Curie susceptibility, and that's exactly 
what we observe here. So when you plot the susceptibility of your material as a function of uh, as a function of temperature and you plot it on a log scale, you get a, slope, uh, a line with slope one half, and that's exactly the change in magnetization that we're exploiting at the lowest temperature. Uh, the, if you go to really low temperatures, below 10 millikelvin, you no longer have the 1 over T uh, dependence. And that's because at that point, you actually have uh, the spins interacting with one another and they form a spin lattice. So that basically limits how low you can go in energy. So what did we do at the time for the first uh, project that we did on this technology? Well, we looked around and the best group in this field actually happens to be in Germany. Uh, uh, that's why we're working with this group of uh, Christian Enz. Uh, they had developed this technology uh, perfectly, and we were very lucky that one of the Berkeley graduate students not only was interested in working with us, he also spoke German. So what we did is we sent him to Germany for three months so that he could learn from uh, that group and build the detectors with him. On the uh, left-hand side here, you can see what these detectors look like. There's an absorber here for the gamma rays. There are these posts by which the absorber is separated from your sensor here. And then there is the pickup coil to pick up the magnetic change. So the gamma ray comes to this place, uh, it's absorbed here, heats up the absorber and the sensor. This sensor changes its magnetic properties. And here's the pickup coil that picks up the change in magnetic uh, properties and then feeds it into the squid preamplifier to read out the signal. And so Cameron was working with the guys in Germany, and this, these were the materials, these were the detectors that he built. You can see these are eight uh, MMC detectors, number one through number eight, uh, and they consist of, they're about half a millimeter by two millimeters long, so about a cubic millimeter in size, and um, there's eight of them so that we can get uh, higher resolution, a higher efficiency, and the detectors are then um, they are electroplated and they're electroplated to a thickness of about 200 micron so that we can have some decent efficiency. Now in the past, these detectors worked very well and I'll show you some of the, um, some of the results that uh, Cameron got from, from these detectors. More recently, there's sort of the hope that there are actually new materials that might even have better properties than the gold erbium that we use so far. And that's why we're now also working with the University of New Mexico. There is a professor who has a lot of experience with magnetic materials at super low temperatures. And we're trying to introduce silver erbium as a new detector material. The two grad students working on this. And these are the devices that they're, uh, that they're building. Again, you can see these are the, in the middle of these devices. You have the pickup coil. That's where the detector is going to be placed. And then you have the squid preamplifiers to read out the signal on the same chip. These chips, by the way, they are made by photolithography. It's the same technique that people use to make computer chips. Uh, so if you develop a process to, uh, to fabricate these detectors, it's very easy to make hundreds of them. And that's important because um, if you want to make arrays of these devices, you need to make sure that you don't need to make every single one of them individually, that you can make them all in one batch. And the photolithography um, process that people have developed for a multi-billion dollar industry right next door in Silicon Valley. That's exactly the right process that we're using uh, to, uh, to make these detectors. So we're actually taking the old hand-me-downs from the semiconductor industry to make uh, our detectors because the semiconductor industry develops the processes, but they couldn't care less about materials as weird as silver erbium or electroplated gold uh, to you know, several hundred microns thick. That's something that we have to develop ourselves. And then on the right hand side, this is uh, before the uh, application of the absorber here on the right hand side, you can see what the finished chip looks like. You have the individual pixels here in the middle. Uh, the signals get read out here by the squid. And um, then you connect to the uh, pixels uh, with the wire bonds here on that side. Now, I told you at the very beginning that these detectors operate at incredibly low temperatures. And um, people were always a little bit afraid when they hear that, uh, you know, they, you have to operate these detectors at, at 100 or 50 or even lower uh, millikelvin temperatures. 
before you can operate them. And so one of the interesting things that has happened uh, over the last 20 years, and our group was very much involved in that process, um, people have developed refrigerators that can actually be cooled to these incredibly low temperatures, completely automated, without, without any cryogenic liquids. Uh, probably most of you have worked with liquid nitrogen or at least have known liquid nitrogen. I always tell them that uh, I hope you have all watched Terminator 2 and you understand that liquid nitrogen is dangerous, can kill people because you don't have the reassembly qualities that the Terminator has. Um, but these days you don't even need the liquid nitrogen or liquid helium anymore. There are cryogenic coolers that you can use to get to these temperatures, completely automated, um, basically push a button, you come back uh, next day, and 24 hours later, the instrument is, uh, is at 10 millikelvin. And so when you look at the right-hand picture, this is what uh, these so-called dilution refrigerators look like. It's a, it's a big instrument, probably human size. They're on a big frame here. And uh, if you open it up to see what it looks on the inside, there are different stages. This year is at room temperature. This year is at 60 Kelvin. This year is at 4 Kelvin. This year is at 1 Kelvin. And there are lower temperature stages that get you down all the way to 10 millikelvin. And inside on these low temperature stages, that's where you actually have your detector. That's where you mount it. And you mount it in such a fashion that it faces the outside wall so that you can have a radioactive source on the outside of this um, uh, detector and record the gamma radiation uh, on the inside. And here's the detector that we have that we have built. Um, and so when Cameron was in, in uh, Heidelberg, of course, he took his detectors and cooled it down and tested it with an americium-241 source. And uh, these are the results that he got. Um, beautifully high energy resolution. So you can see uh, at the energy of 60 kilovolt, that's the characteristic energy of uh, the americium-241. You have an energy resolution below 50 EV. That's more than a factor 10 better than what you can do with germanium. But again, the price that you pay is you have a very small detector and it operates at very low temperatures. So by no means will these detectors ever replace germanium, but they will complement it. They will basically provide a uh, alternative detection mechanism in those cases where you need really high resolution. Uh, and you know these neptunium lines here, neptunium L lines are a good example. They are part only by a hundred or a few hundred EV, and you really, uh, if you want to resolve these lines or lines that are similarly closely spaced, <clears throat> cryogenic is the only way to go. Now, until about uh, until this year, we had we didn't have one of these uh, dilution refrigerators at Livermore. We had only detectors that could gain, get down only to 35 millikelvin, and believe it or not, 35 millikelvin is actually not quite cold enough. Uh, to uh, for these detectors. Uh, you can still do good science with them, but I wanted to show you this pictures because these are the instruments that we're actually using at Livermore right now until we're getting our own dilution refrigerator. So the work that we do involves a lot of cryogenic engineering where we have to design certain parts that then are put into our, uh, into our cryostat. Our detectors typically sits inside a magnetic shield here. Uh, all the gold-plated parts are stuff that you need to get to these low temperatures. Our squid preamplifier sits here at 4 Kelvin, and then you feed the signal out. And uh, this is what the uh, what uh, one of the instruments looks uh, like. You can see there is a little window here. The detector sits behind the window at a temperature of uh, you know 35 millikelvin. This instrument is also um, completely automated. There's a pulse tube that cools you down from room temperature to about 3 Kelvin. And then there's a form of magnetic cooling that cools you down to 35 millikelvin. And when people at Livermore were first aware of um, detectors that could have an energy resolution you know, well below 100 EV, one of the old guys at Livermore, the first question that he asked was, well, can you see plutonium-242? And at that time, I didn't quite understand why he was so interested in plutonium-242, um, but here's why. This is just one of the, uh, one of the 
reasons why people are interested in these detectors. Plutonium-242 is one of the isotopes of plutonium that you generate in a nuclear reactor. So when you uh, take spent nuclear fuel out of the reactor and put it into a re reprocessing plant, this is one of the isotopes that, uh, that you get. And when you look at some of these modern reprocessing plants, most of you will probably have heard of a place called Rokasho, the big reprocessing plant that the Japanese are building currently. Um, it's huge. I mean, look at this plant. It's a, it's a huge site. Uh, they will basically have many, many tons of nuclear fuel per year. They will have a total of eight tons of plutonium in their spent fuel that they're going to process every year. You want to know very well how much plutonium goes into your reprocessing plant and how much comes out of it, because the significant quantity of plutonium is only eight kilograms. So if you're processing eight tons of plutonium a, a year, then a 1% error in the amount, amount of plutonium in, uh, that you process corresponds to 10 significant quantities of plutonium. That would basically be enough plutonium for uh, up to 10 nuclear weapons. This is definitely something that the safeguards community is incredibly interested in because they need to make sure that they understand where the plutonium is going to. And um, so typically what they have to do, they, they separate basically the uh, uranium and the plutonium from the fission products in one of these plants. And then they need to do an isotope analysis to find out uh, how much of which isotope do they have. And one of the isotopes that they currently cannot measure is plutonium-242. And the reason for that is plutonium-242 has only a very small number of lines, three lines. And the strongest line, all of these strong lines are very close to much, much stronger lines from the plutonium-240. So here is where you expect the plutonium-242 line, and it completely overlaps with the plutonium-240 line. So you would never be able to see this with the germanium detector. So what they have to do in Rokasho they actually have to do destructive analysis with mass spectrometry so that they uh, understand the isotopic composition of the plutonium and can then infer how much total plutonium and how many fissile material they have in their um, in their power plants. And that's very expensive. I mean, it's a huge amount of the cost that the IAEA spends these days is on making sure that you know how much plutonium is produced and uh, and which kind of isotopes. So that was, of course, a big, a big question for us. Can we see that line? And so this was Cameron's thesis experiment. We made a sample where we mixed a little bit of weapons grade plutonium with plutonium-242. And the spectrum that I'm showing you here, that's the gamma spectrum once taken with a high-resolution germanium detector in red and once with our magnetic microcalorimeter in green. You can see the lines are maybe a factor five to ten or so narrower than the plutonium lines. And the line that we really care about is here around 44, 45 kilovolt. This small line is due to plutonium 242. And you can see it's very close to the plutonium 240 line, but it is well separated. So we can actually do spectroscopic analysis. Now, we should also be honest um, the germanium spectrum took about two hours to take. Um, the MMC spectrum took about two weeks to take. Now, that's not acceptable, right? You don't want to do this. And that's because we only had two small pixels. So the obvious thing that we need to do, we need to basically make more pixels so that we can, uh, that we can build higher efficiency detectors and, use, uh, and do these measurements much faster so that the measurements become more useful uh, for practical applications. But even with this particular experiment, we can, we can already try to do some uh, isotopic analysis. So let's see how far we can get. Here's your plutonium-240 line. And if you, you want to know what the ratio of plutonium-242 to plutonium-240 to 249 to 248 is, you basically need to measure the uh, relative intensity of the various lines. And then you need to scale it for the branching ratios and the lifetimes and for the efficiency with which you detect these lines. And then you can get isotope analysis. Um, 
Well, here's again where a couple of details come in. It turns out that all of these analysis routines that you actually can buy and that people have developed over the years, they all assume that you're using a germanium detector because uh, people had not been using gold-based detectors in the past. And uh, so you actually have to write your own analysis routines for, for quantitative analysis and you have to quantify the efficiency as a function of energy. And so that's what we've done here. And uh, then we can see the, we can get the a mass spectrometry analysis that this particular sample contains 11.1 EV plus minus 0.4%, 11.1% uh, plus minus 0.4% of plutonium-242. And when you compare this with a mass spec result, that's very well within the error of the measurement. So this is the first uh, non-destructive analysis of a mixed isotope plutonium sample ever that contains plutonium-242. So quantitative non-destructive analysis is possible in those cases where germanium is limited by line overlap. So for most cases, you will lose germanium when you have special samples where you need a very small isotope uh, or a, an isotope that you can not see over the Compton background. That's where the cryogenic detectors come in um, as long as you, um, you know, as you have enough resolution to separate the lines of interest from the lines um, that you um, that you want to separate them from. So here's where we stand. What's going on right now? Because that is sort of the area where we're currently looking for interested students. Just hired a postdoc in our field uh, who who has done this work for fundamental science applications on the neutrinoless double beta decay. Uh, that was a high-profile science experiment. We now want to use this for more practical nuclear analysis of, um, of um, radioactive material. So four areas for technology development. We need to go to lower temperatures. So that's the thing that's going to happen over the next year. We have just bought our gamma ray or new refrigerator that will allow us to get to 10 millikelvin. We have to equip this. We have to put things together, uh, equip it with wiring and um, and make sure that everything works uh, in, in this exp uh, experiment at the lower temperature. So there's a lot of cryogenic engineering that needs to be involved. We're working on new detector designs. Um, you know, one of the uh, problems with these uh, cryogenic detectors for all cryogenic detector technologies is that they're very slow. So cryogenic, uh, an array helps you with that because then you can run many detectors in parallel, but uh, you also want to speed up the response time of every individual pixel. And if we can do this, we have several ideas that would be a huge improvement in sensitivity. And so that's where cryogenic, uh, where the engineering of the detector itself comes into the picture. And that's what's going to happen with our colleagues in Heidelberg and in New Mexico. And then we need to work uh, on developing small arrays. You know, we currently have two small pixels and that uh, need, we need to improve from 2 to 32 pixels. That's the goal for the next few years. And I told you that for the first experiment, we uh, it took about two weeks with uh, 32 pixels. It would The same thing would be done you know, in a day. And that's the kind of uh, time scale that is actually acceptable. When people get samples for safeguards experiments, they typically run them for 12 hours with a germanium detector. So if you now run them for 12 hours with the cryogenic detectors, and get much higher sensitivity because you can resolve things that would be that would be acceptable now eventually you even want to make larger arrays but let's make sure that we can get 32 pixels to work at the same time that would already be a huge improvement because we could then speed up the, uh, the measurement and we could alternatively measure weaker sources uh, with very small and low intensity lines and then what we're doing is we're working on different sensor materials. I mentioned we're trying to replace our gold erbium sensors with silver erbium, which should have better qualities because of some nuclear effects in gold. It turns out that gold has a nuclear quadrupole moment. There's a heat capacity associated with it that we don't want because it reduces our signal. Uh, silver erbium uh, does not have a nuclear quadrupole moment because there's no uh, because the both isotopes of silver only have a spin half nucleus so silver erbium should in theory be better we're working on making sure that this is actually the case experimentally 
and that's where the University of New Mexico comes in uh, with these detectors. So there's a whole bunch of uh, technology development to be done, and uh, this is where we're looking for help. Um, and then, of course, there are a whole bunch of new applications that we want to pursue. So one of the things um, that we're particularly interested in is to improve the accuracy of enri uh, enrichment measurements. Um, so what you can, what I'm showing you here on the um, left-hand side is a spectrum of um, a uh, of a low enriched uranium source. And you can use these lines for high accuracy, non-destructive analysis of the uranium enrichment. It turns out that these two lines here, they correspond to thorium-234. They can be used as a proxy for the amount of uranium-238 is in your sample. And this small line corresponds to, is mostly emitted by uranium-235, it's the thorium-K alpha-1 line. So the ratio of this little line to these two lines gives you a measure of the uranium enrichment. And so you will ask, well, why do we, we can't we use other lines? And absolutely, people you do use other lines for uranium enrichment. But the problem is when you have lines that are very far apart, then it is very hard to determine the absolute efficiency or the, the, the relative efficiency with which you can de uh, detect these two lines. And these systematic errors, they affect your, the accuracy of your enrichment measurement. So for all high accuracy measurements, you need to use lines that are very close together so that you know very well what the relative efficiency is with which you detect these two lines. And so for uranium, it turns out it's these two lines here in the 90 kilovolt region that you can use. Uh, and uh, you can see you can separate them very nicely for, um, for a cryogenic detector and you cannot separate them for germanium. And you know, this is something that the IAEA again cares very much about. When you look at the um, the values, the target values for non-destructive analysis, depending on what kind of sample and what kind of detector you have, the accuracy of your enrichment measurement is somewhere between five and uh, ten percent with a high purity germanium detector. So, if you need an accuracy that is higher than that for your enrichment measurement, you need to go to mass spectrometry, and then you can improve your accuracy with um, with uh, with mass spectrometry, so by an order of magnitude, roughly. Now, you can project just based on uh, what you can do with the germanium detector, uh, with the magnetic microcalorimeter. So current detectors, they're barely competitive with germanium. And look at this, you would have to wait for, you know, take for a really, really long time. But if you improve the speed, and if you go to text, uh, to arrays, and if you do some other tricks to lower the background in your measurement, it is very much possible to make these magnetic microcalorimeters competitive with, non with destructive analysis, enrichment measurement. And this is just one of the examples that people like us are interested in, um, because ultimately what we want us to do, we want to make sure that our instruments are used by, you know, some of the uh, reprocessing plants or the uh, IAEA or other places that really do nuclear analysis on a, on a daily basis. Doesn't mean that this is the only application they're pursuing, but for this particular talk, I thought this is the one that I'll, that I'll focus on. So, let me summarize. The magnetic microcalorimeters, the MMCs that we're developing, are uh, ultra high resolution gamma ray detectors. They operate at really low temperatures and uh, they're basically really sensitive, really accurate thermometers that can measure the change in uh, magnetization when a single uh, gamma ray is absorbed. You can get an energy resolution that's a factor 10 or so better than what you can do with germanium. Shown your data of you know, 50 EV resolution uh, at 15 millikelvin. So far, we can only get to 90, uh, about 100 EV resolution at Livermore because we can only go to 35 millikelvin, but we've just bought a new refrigerator so that we can finally compete with the guys in Heidelberg. Uh, they have a very high linear degree of linearity and reproducibility so that you can enable all kinds of different applications. Plutonium-242 is one of the uh, applications that I've shown you for. High accuracy enrichment measurements of uranium, that's another one. 
There are also fundamental physics experiments. There's a whole bunch of things that people use in different fields here that require this resolution. And so it's a, it's a vibrant young field with, uh, with new opportunities. But what we need to do, we need higher speed, and that means we need to speed up the response of an individual detector, and we need to increase the number of pixels so that we can run many pixels at the same time and don't have to wait for two weeks before we take a spectrum. And we also want to improve the energy resolution and the performance of these detectors. And for that reason, we're going to introduce new, uh, oops, that should be silver erbium and uh, lower temperatures. So uh, that's where we stand. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them if you have them right now. Thanks. So any, any questions from me? I'm not sure. How does it, how do you work? Does it work? Do you ask, do people ask questions over the? I do. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about additional applications in nuclear security. You mentioned non-destructive assay. That is, is the, there, yeah. in, in nuclear, so there are, there are two particular, uh, two um, applications. The one of them is isotope ratios. Wherever you need isotope ratios, that is for safeguards, for monitoring, uh, for uh, whenever you, when you need to understand how much uh, how much uh, plutonium you generate in your nuclear fuel, all these things rely on accurate measurements of isotope ratios. So that's one of the main safeguards applications. And there's a fundamental reason always why you want to go to high resolution detectors, as I said, because whenever you want to extract is ext accurate isotope ratios from a spectrum, you need to know very accurately how, uh, what, with what efficiency you detect each line. And that is much, much easier when you have lines that are, have very similar energies uh, because uh, it's very hard to do an accurate um, calibration of the efficiency in, uh, when you have the lines far apart. Partially that's because it's very hard to determine the exact geometry. Partially that's also because some of the radiation is actually absorbed in your source itself. And a priori, you never know how much of the radiation is actually absorbed in the source. So uh, you don't know with which efficiency the radiation comes out of your source. And because of that, you need two lines with similar energies, because at that point, they emanate from your source with the, high, with the same probability. and um, and that makes the efficiency calculations much, much easier. And then you need, you know, you need lines that are closely spaced. So all the uh, programs that people are using, you know, the FRAM program, some of you may be familiar with, or the MGA program that people are using, they are based on having lines with uh, similar energies uh, for the highest accuracy in non-destructive analysis. So plutonium analysis is one example. Uranium analysis is one example. Here is, uh, this is one of the examples where, you know, sometimes you have lines that you simply cannot see. A good example is uranium-236 is, uh, is one of the isotopes that people cannot see in, uh, in nuclear analysis. Uranium-236 is very important because it doesn't occur in nature. So uranium, if your sample contains uranium-236, that top typically means that it has been exposed to neutrons and was at a, um, you know, most uranium samples contain uranium-235. And if you have neutron capture in uranium-235, you'll get uh, uranium-236. So if you want to have, uh, want to see whether a sample, an unknown sample that you have from somewhere has actually been exposed to neutrons for whatever reasons we can think of, benign reason or we can think of not so benign reasons then you produce uranium-236 you want to make sure that you can measure this very accurately um, but the uranium-236 line that uh, exists is very here at 50 kilovolt is very close to uranium-238 line and typically you have much much more uranium-238 in your sample than uranium-236 
So you could not use, you cannot use traditional detectors for these kind of measurements. And that's why the guys from Savannah River sent, up one of, sent us one of their samples. They said, well, you know, can you, uh, can you see whether you can, can you check whether you can see any uranium 236? And sure enough, with these detectors, you can. And then there's one, one other thing that, uh, that is sort of interesting. When people first um, built germanium detectors, there were millions of lines that they saw that they could never see before with the scintillator detectors. And here in this spectrum, there's sort of one sample like this. If you look here in the low energy region around 26 kilovolt, there's one line at 26 point something kilovolt. Uh, we have no idea what it is. It doesn't show up in any databases. It doesn't make any sense. And that's probably because, well, you know, people typically don't look at these low energies because typically you have too much of a Compton background in this area. You, uh, you know, uh, you don't see these lines. And so just like you could see new lines when the germanium detectors came first online, you can now start to see lines that you couldn't see in the past and improve the, uh, your, your literature tables. So one of the examples for this you asked about Safeguards application is, you know, currently people are interested in uranium-233. And the reason why that is the case is because uranium-233 is also a fissile material. And it is the fissile material that you produce in the thorium fuel cycles. So if you have a nuclear power plant that uses the thorium fuel cycle, uh, uranium-233 is a material that you care very much about. And the reason why this is interesting, because India has just, you know, under the George W. Bush administration, there was an agreement with India that uh, made India, uh, that allowed India to produce, um, you know, to have access to the international nuclear technologies in exchange for putting their, uh, their civilian reactors under nuclear safeguards. Now, India had not ratified the uh, non proliferation treaty. Um, and India happens to sit on 90% uh, of the world's thorium. So India is very interested in developing technologies for nuclear reactors based on thorium because it's a huge country, they have big energy problems, and they are very much aware of the fact that global warming is going to be a problem for them. And one of the ways to uh, reduce their dependency on fossil fuels is to use thorium-based power plants. Suddenly, uranium-233 becomes very important. Suddenly, the people in Washington come to us and say, well, Stefan, can you make precise measurements of the uranium-233 lines and their branching ratios? Because we need to be able to make very accurate measurements of on uranium-233, and you can give us the most accurate measurements of the various lines and the intensities associated with it. So these are some of the applications that people talk about and why they give us money. While you're on this slide, the, the MMC uh, resolution is better than the transition edge sensor resolution, correct? The MMC resolution, our MMC resolution is better than our TES uh, resolution. So there are basically, uh, now you're talking about, this. Is, these are some older data that, that we took. Yeah, yeah. So they actually we were actually not taken with MMCs. They were taken with something called a transition edge sensor. That's an alternative low temperature detector technology. Now, we worked on that for a while, but it turns out that our detect our TES sensors were never as good as they could have been. There are other groups that build TES detectors that are roughly comparable in, uh, in their energy resolution. As far as fundamental differences are concerned, um, the transition edge sensors have, a, on a fundamental level, they have a slightly worse energy resolution by about a factor of two. Uh, than the magnetic microcalorimeters. Now, the transition edge sensors have been around for much longer, and there has been much more development for this kind of low temperature detector technology. So currently, this technology is further ahead, but the magnetic microcalorimeters, they have uh, probably a brighter future because there are some fundamental properties that are better about MMCs than about TESs. And that's why we have actually switched from TESs to MMCs to develop this technology. And then I also wanted to ask about uh, how much you have to worry about detector damage. 
uh, from something like neutrons. Since you're measuring things that will emit neutrons, do you worry about detector damage? And we have so far never been in a neutron field that was strong enough to, to damage the detectors. But I'm sure if you put enough neutrons onto any sure. detector long term, yeah. that's not a particularly good thing. No. So um, I cannot quantify this. I can only say for the applications that we're currently pursuing, neutron damage is not a concern. No. But I'm sure if you put these things, you know, in a hot cell, cell with a really nasty neutron flux, um, you have to think about it. Sure. Then you presumably would have to enclose your entire detector in some neutron shielding material to absorb the neutrons before they make it to your detector. Um, it's not been a concern so far, but um, you know, we'll we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. John. Um, so a lot of times when you're going after efficiency, you can develop volume and not number of detectors. What's the limit on your guys' detector size? So the the equation. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's not visible here. So the uh, energy resolution scales with the temperature and with the heat capacity and the heat capacity scales with the volume. Okay. So typically you ask yourself, what is the energy resolution that you need? You know, can you get away with 100 EV or do you need 50 EV energy resolution? And my general um, statement has always been for most applications of interest for us at this point, 100 EV is fine. Then you ask yourself, well, how low can you go technically in temperature without running into problems? Well, you used to be, we used to be at 100, then we went to 35 millikelvin. Now we're going to uh, 10 millikelvin. So you're actually gaining a lot uh, because you can go to lower temperatures. And then you say, well, you know, what are the materials that we can have so that we, uh, that we can have low heat capacity? Currently, we can use the materials that we use, they limit us to a cubic millimeter per detector. That's sort of the rough idea, cubic millimeter per detector. And then when you go to 32, then it's 32 cubic millimeter. They are not big. So one of the things that uh, why these detectors, uh, why this is, and this obviously we would love to have them bigger. Problem is <laughs> if you make them really bigger, then they also get much slower because it takes so much longer time. So you can't make them so much bigger because then you really go go down in in uh, total energy in in count rate capabilities. That is okay for some applications. So for people look, for example, for uh, the neutrinoless double beta decay, like the postdoc our postdoc did for his PhD. These are events where you look for you know one event per you know minute or so. That's fine. There you can have time constants of a second. That's not a big deal. But if you want to do nuclear analysis, you, you're running into problems there. You, know, you, don't, you don't want to wait for so long. So long story short, the back of the envelope number is you want 100 dB resolution that forces you to get to about a millimeter cubed with the current materials. And then you basically scale them up to a raise as much as your funding agency allows you to pay for. So also you showed an efficiency plot, um, and I, I can't quite see the scale. Is that, I think it's relative. Um, and so yes. it, it runs from about 30 to 60 kV and has a relative efficiency. So um, A, how does this behave as you go up in energy? So the reason, the reason why this efficiency is, uh, is reduced at low energies, you may know that at low temperature, what you actually, the strongest line from any of these sources are actually, well, let's see whether we have them, are the uh, X-ray lines. So if you have a detector that is really, really slow and your strongest lines are the X-ray lines, then you want to suppress those. So what we actually had to do for the, for the experiments of the plutonium, we had to uh, put 
several millimeters thick uh, aluminum in front between the source and the detector so that we would absorb the X-ray lines. And that would reduce the efficiency at low energies, but that was okay because we cared mostly about the efficiency at the 45 uh, kilovolt line. So typically what you care about is are the energies bit, uh, below 100 kilovolt. There are very few examples where you need to have the super high resolution above 200 kilovolts. So currently what people use, they use a coaxial germanium detector above 400 kilovolt and they use a LEPS germanium detector, a low energy, high resolution germanium detector below 400 kilovolt. So people are very comfortable with the idea to use two detectors, one for the higher energies, one for the lower energies. What I assume is going to happen with these cryogenic detectors, um, you will use a germanium detector above 200. I mean, either you stay with the germanium detectors that you have, or for energies below 200 kilovolts, you use a cryogenic detectors because that's where you really have the line overlap problems. At the higher energies, a germanium has enough resolution to separate the various lines. And at high energies, the small size of your uh, cryogenic detector pixels really starts to hurt you. And so the trade-off that you make is say, okay, let's focus on the areas where people really have line overlap problems. And that's 100, typically 100 kilovolt and below. There's a famous example at 186 where the uranium-235 line has an overlap problem with radium-226. So that was a that was a fine example for when I gave a similar talk at the IAEA. The head of the um, Zybersdorf Safeguards Lab, his first questions was, "Well, do these things work at 186 kilovolt?" And you know, why was he interested in that? Is well, they wanted to look at illegal uranium mining. So they wanted to see whether some of the mines have been removing all the uranium without telling anyone. And the way you do this is you basically look at the ratio between uranium and its decay products. And one of the decay products is uh, radium-226. Uh, so if you look at the, at the ratio of a uranium line, uranium-235 with, uranium, with radium-226, two closely spaced lines so that you can do accurate measurements of this ratio, you can, you can monitor, but you look at them at the tailings and the emissions from the tailings from the mines. And these things tell you uh, whether they have been taking the uranium out. So this is one of the examples where you actually need to go to 186 kilovolts. There have been very few people, so far actually none, who have given me a, a really serious problem where they need to use these detectors above 200 kilovolts. And so that's sort of the area that, that we're focusing on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and we talked about kind of doing a smaller focus group where we could all talk about opportunities in the lab.